Hello. Uh, thank you for attending again, as always. Like the familiar group. All right. So as I get your names down, although it's pretty much the same list. Hello, teacher. Covering today is um, the antebellum westward movement. And, oh my goodness. Like you have to choose like a narrative, you know, um, discourse, or uh, you'll get lost in all the data. Uh, there's just so much that happens. Uh, the 1830s through 50s uh, in the West alone. So at any rate, I try to uh, do just that as I put it into um, a couple different um, narratives. All right. And so, um, oh, shoot. Let's see here. Oh, thank goodness I can do this. Normally, I do this before we meet. I have it opened up already. I apologize. I'm glad I could do that while we're together. All right. And so um, are you seeing this opening up? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're looking here, right? Of course, this swath right here, this huge swath, like 19 future states. This is Louisiana Purchase Territory uh, from 1803. We've gone over that. This was uh, Coahuila y Texas, Coahuila and Texas combined as a state under Mexico, under Spain first and under Mexico. And this is California or Alta California, Upper California, as opposed to Baja. Uh, and the, the this huge contingent here uh, claimed uh, going back as early as the 1540 Coronado expedition uh, from the Spanish and then in 1824 uh, when Mexico gained its independence. And so um, here we are uh, on number one. I'm just simply playing, a, uh, I'm doing a blame game. Uh, way back when, when I was a student, they did great man history. And they, um, they made a villain out of Polk, uh, James K. Polk, the president who uh, uh, just unabashedly said he wanted Mexican California. And he wanted it uh, for the United States. Um, and then it was juxtaposed with court history of the Alamo, of uh, these Anglos in Mexican Texas who wanted liberty, who wanted uh, local autonomy. Uh, and so that was an interesting juxtaposition. But a lot of it was a uh, top-down history, right? A, a bi biographical information on the leaders of the rebellions and leaders of the US, et cetera. And so since then, there's been a lot of social history uh, uh, picking up letters of correspondence from that time period from common folk, uh, newspaper articles, uh, et cetera. And it gives us, a, it's hence given us a, a much better feel for having a more holistic view of it, uh, of what was going on in that generation. And so what I simply do here on number one is in playing that uh, blame game uh, for taking the far West, uh, I contend that you ought to indict um, the entire generation of citizens uh, instead of just the political leaders, okay? So keep that in mind. Now with the political leaders, do is there plenty of evidence of racism uh, juxtaposed with uh, a, a lust for land? Absolutely. So right here, uh, what he believed, this is John Quincy Adams, what he believed to be a vicious cycle of racial intolerance and lust for others' lands, okay? that elected politicians were fanning the flames of racism among their constituents, using people of other ethnic extractions as an other, right, sociologically, psychologically, against which white Americans could feel a sense of unity. So this became, this was, you know, I, it's something to, to consider is that um, the fact that this was a popular thing to do. This was, this, this was a way to curry votes. Um, especially in the South, uh, amongst the Democratic Party members. And so at any rate, um, yes, you see uh, racism from the top down. Uh, so, I mean, look at this here. Politicians at the time. Are we supposed right. to be seeing the 
assignment because I'm only seeing the page where you have all the documents. Sorry. Oh, no problem. Here, let me start over. Let me stop sharing. And now let me share. Man, I hope that I hope that does it. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry uh -huh. about that. No problem. Thank you for letting me know. So this is the quote that I just went over uh, in red. He believed to be a vicious cycle of racial intolerance and lust for others' lands that elected politicians were fanning the flames of racism among their constituents, using people of other ethnic extractions as an other against which white Americans could feel a sense of unity. We've gone over that term populism, right? Where you appeal to the lowest common denominators um, in, in your constituency. Uh, their xenophobia, their intolerance, their prejudices, their greed and ambition. Uh, you, you push those you know, somewhat negative buttons uh, to, to get their votes basically, okay? Um, remember that there was a guy about this time named John Stuart Mill over in England and he wrote about this, he and his wife. Um, he, uh, he's kind of the, a father of modern liberalism. Uh, yeah, John Stuart Mill. And at any rate, um, he wrote uh, on liberty. He wrote on the subjugation of women. But in, in his treatise on, on liberty is he contended that, um, you know, before the French Revolution and the, the Ansan regime, as it was called, the world before it, uh, it was very aristocratic. Remember, aristoi means the best in Greek. And so you, it's ruled by a privileged caste of people. Remember, caste as opposed to class uh, mm -hmm. suggests that the uh, boundaries in the socioeconomic pyramid are permanent and there's not much wiggle room to move up and down, not much socioeconomic mobility. And so the, the, the betters, right, so-called, self-proclaimed, that they are um, they're entitled to uh, politically have domination, okay? Certain positions only only to them, not elected. Uh, certainly, no universal citizenship and citizen uh, po political participation. And then economically, uh, they usually have uh, the means to, in a Marxist way, they have the the um, the means of production, most of the resources in their hands, most of the most lucrative opportunities. And then even socially, uh, even the poor try to imitate their culture, okay, to some extent. So they, they had political, economic, and social hegemony or domination. And he said it was great when that it was a lesser evil, he pretty much called it, when you develop more democratic governments. Remember, demos were people, the common people in Greek. So when you include the common people and you have one of your own, some of your own elected reps uh, ruling you, then you're more likely to share um, the same interest and not perhaps be in a parasitical situation with your rulers as before the French Revolution, when they clearly the aristocracy uh, very often enjoyed privileges at the expense of those less fortunate. So now when you have one of your own in there running the show, you have a congruence of, of interest. Uh, everyone's on the same page. Right. But uh, uh, to John Stuart Mill, he said that is going to cause new issues to arise. And one of them that he wrote much on was that he was concerned about public opinion uh, becoming tyrannical. OK, uh, in his case over in England, it had a lot to do, evidently, according to him, to religion. Uh, those who disagreed with Orthodox Anglican you know, doctrine, et cetera, and practices uh, were uh, still being persecuted. And, um, and he, that concerned him. But transform that same phenomenon over to the Americas, and it didn't seem to be ideological or religious. Uh, it seemed to be oftentimes ethnic or racist, right? That uh, the, the large segment of public opinion could turn against uh, certain numerical minority or marginalized minority groups that didn't have a voice in government yet. And we saw that in the Andrew Jackson uh, assignment just previous to this one, right? So uh, this phenomenon is still going 10 years later. So yes, you have senators, governors saying some awful stuff. I mean, look at this. Um,
He said, is there not yet hatred enough between the races which compose your Southern population and the population of Mexico? Actually, that's a popular uh, claim, uh, but where is it? Sorry. Oh, down here, politicians. So the first Anglo governor of California contended that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races. Uh, Charles Benton of New Mexico said the Mexican character is made up of stupidity, obstinacy, which is stubbornness, uh, ignorance, duplicity, and vanity. Uh, Senator Hannigan of Indiana, right, said that the Anglo and Hispanic races, or I'll interchangeably say Latino races, were incompatible, that in no reasonable period could or should we amalgamate. And he's talking about miscegenation, interethnic marriage, sex, procreation. All right. And so, uh, wow. Okay. So we know that a lot of the politicians, uh, they could have harbored and, and often did clearly uh, leave a, uh, a written footprint of their prejudices. Okay. Uh, but that to me, uh, number one, does not let their, the masses of people in their time period off the hook, uh, culpability wise. All right. Uh, so um, I'm going to move down here, for instance. Pardon. Okay, so right here, look at this. Um, this, this paragraph right here. If Santa Ana's archaic constitution provided some complexity to the issue of Anglo confiscation of Hispanic lands, the Mexican-American War 12 years later was brutally clear in its unjust nature. According to historian Robert Mary, American politicians in the mid-1840s recognized and presidential election results clearly proved that annexation of Mexican soil was popularly embraced. The Alabama Monitor printed a warning to presidential hopeful Henry Clay that his opposition to taking Texas could cost him the presidency, as most Americans wanted such. In return, Henry Clay issued his second Alabama letter in which he avowed that he would change his stance, which was initially against the Mexican-American War, and simply be guided by public opinion. So he wanted the presidency that badly, right? Where he said, okay, fine. I had qualms about, uh, you know, uh, grabbing the far west from Mexico. But if that's really what my voters want, I want to be president. And so fine, I'll capitulate and I will become a mouthpiece of your um, your views, of your desires, etc. Future President Polk was approached several times by fellow Southerners like Francis Perkins, who himself was sent from very powerful John C. Calhoun, the Senator of South Carolina, who even threatened secession. So the states already this early were threatening to leave the country in the South if Polk did not support annexation of Mexican territory. And then I put here, granted, Polk already leaned in that direction personally. Nevertheless, that such pressure was applied to him suggests that Southerners of his generation deserve blame for American imperialism along with him. Okay, but not just Southerners, says here. According to historian Mary, New news reports and local political analyses suggested widespread support for annexation in Pennsylvania, New England, Indiana, Illinois, and elsewhere in the North. When Polk won the presidency on such an expansionist platform, he failed to put into his cabinet Northern, uh, well, that's another topic. Uh, so I'll stop there. But so, uh, like I said, when you put together what we did in the Jackson period, Remember, uh, political participation went up from 1824 to 1840 uh, in the, the presidential election. 20-something percent of Americans that were citizens voted for the president in 1824. Over 80 percent of eligible citizens voted for the president in 1840. So that's going to give you a sense of accountability. And and. And remember the term used by um, Andrew Jackson when he attacked the, 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 the National Bank and when he forced the trails of tears uh, upon the Native American tribes, the five civilized tribes, is he, con he contended that he had a popular mandate 
And remember, my, like mandato means command in Spanish. Like it mm -hmm. was a popular command from his people. That's what they wanted. So that's what he was going to give to them. Okay. So at any rate, um, not only do you see that uh, in pressure upon politicians, but you see it also in the populations that move there to the West. Okay. So uh, for instance, uh, those who went into Texas. Okay. Look at here. Mr. Austin, Moses Austin, the dad, and then Stephen Austin, the son, received that, re received that title from first Spain, the dad did, and then from Mexico, the son did, uh, of impresario. And it was like a, um, like a, uh, an adelantado back in Spain. It, it's like a, a provincial governor. Okay. He was given 66,000 acres personally, but notice he was able to give over 4,000 acres to the initial uh, gringos that went into his realm in Eastern Texas as their impresario. In return, he and his inhabitants were simply to abide by Mexican law and become Roman Catholic. All right. By 1830, the initial arrival of 300 settlers who are, were noted to have assimilated, intermarried with, with uh, Mexican American women, et cetera had skyrocketed to over 7,000, from 300 to 7,000. And it was officially noted that integration and assimilation of Anglos into Hispanic culture and institution had, quote, tapered off. So it seems as if, right, as I say here, the Anglos seemed to habitually throw their weight around. When they felt strength in numbers down in East Texas, they stopped abiding by Mexican regulations. Another instance of that was in Anahuac. Um, Anahuac, uh, there was a, a, an interesting figure named uh, John Bradbird Davis. Uh, he went by Juan Bradbird Davis. So it's kind of emblematic of his, uh, his decision to assimilate uh, to Hispanic culture and to abide by the rules. And so he was given a, a position of tax collector in that town. And on more than one occasion, his life was threatened by these, uh, these, um, these pioneers, these uh, um, squatters coming down into that area because they did not want to abide by, because they were granted so many years exemption from paying taxes uh, by Mexico. But at the end of that term, they were to pay like everybody else and they didn't want to. And so they rebelled against that as well. And then of course, another uh, huge bone of contention that we know of uh, was slavery. Mexico banned slavery. Uh, they, they, they put a prohibition against it in 1824. They finalized it in the early 1830s. <clears throat> but uh, So they were way ahead of us. But even in the state of, of Texas and Coahuila, they, um, they felt such pressure from the gringos who brought slaves with them that they, they, uh, they engaged in a compromise for the time being. But then in comes, and this is a big changing moment, is uh, Mier y Teran, his expedition. Okay, this guy right here in red. His expedition comes up and he brings back to Mexico, nothing, uh, Mexico City, nothing but bad news. He said, listen, guys, the gringos, I will hand it to them. They're very enterprising. Uh, they're bringing, they're like, you know, uh, initiating like saw and grist mills. And um, they have good cash crop farming and making good money. Uh, they're developing towns. Um, they're, they're very forward looking, but he said they're also haughty, right? And remember, to me, the, the word haughty, you could use cocky, you could use arrogant. But to me, haughty almost implies more uh, subjectively. I, I think haughty also is a perfect word, whatever it was translated from Spanish, um, that and I think it was more than like orgulloso, like proud, um, is that they didn't think that the rules that applied to the ethnic Mexicans in Texas had to apply to them. They felt above the law. And there was that sense of rebelliousness and haughtiness in, uh, that's reported by Mier y Teran. And remember also what fits into this, um, this description of Teran 
was the uh, the stereotypical image of the Scots Irish. Many a disproportionate percentage of these gringos in eastern Texas were Scots Irish, and remember they'd had you know there was a King's Mountain episode whereby um, the Continental Army tried to enlist their help in the War for Independence. They said no, thank you. Uh, the British Army, uh, Lord Dunmore of Virginia. Called, asked to call them in through the Cumberland Gap from Kentucky and Tennessee and to be brought back into Virginia to fight for the royal crown. And they said no. And so Dunmore sent a regiment of people to uh, to fight them in Tennessee. And uh, the Scots-Irish won. And they received a letter of accommodation and, and, and congratulations from Washington, George Washington. And he said, now come and fight with us. We're proud of you for defeating the British in that battle. We're, we're, we've all heard of King's Mountain. And they said, no, thank you. <laughs> and George Washington said, basically, I'll deal with you later. So they had that libertarian image already, right? Mm -hmm. Where they were, they were distrustful, almost hateful toward all centralized government. They wanted to do their own thing and they wanted no, they were the ultimate libertarians. Okay. And so I think that plays into it as well, not, not to get too big on the stereotype and, and generalize too much. But I think there's a, at least some truth to that. And so at any rate, when he comes back from that, right, um, under um, Anastasio Bustamante, and you got to remember, as I mentioned earlier, I believe that there's a lot of evidence that... Um, that uh, the gulf between left and right in Mexico was much broader than here. The liberals were more liberal, the conservatives were more conservative, okay? And I won't get into that now unless you ask me specific questions, but, but they just were. Bustamante was uber conservative. He, uh, he stand in army, Catholic church, um, censorship of the press, uh, not very democratic of a republic under him. Uh, no tolerance for multi-parties, uh, et cetera. And Bustamante hears about this and he's like, okay, no, I, we want, uh, we got to do something about this. And so it was known as the April 6th colonization law. And I'm trying to find where, I, that I have to have incorporated that term. But if not, I'll do it now. April 6th. Colonization law. All right. So this law stated that slavery is prohibited in all Mexican territory, including eastern Texas under the impresario uh, Stephen Austin, and that all laws and expectations of all citizens are to be upheld. And for those who were uh, in defiance of such, uh, particularly in Eastern Texas and, and not ethnic Mexicans, they have the right to deport them. Isn't that kind of ironic? And so at any rate, they gave the power of deportation. Um, they declared the emancipation of all the slaves owned by these gringos. And then they also said, for now, uh, indefinitely, uh, no more immigration from Los Estados Unidos, from the U.S. Okay? Well, in this popular narrative, oftentimes, at least back in the day, Stephen Austin is depicted as someone caught in the middle. For instance, uh, he assimilated uh, to Hispanic culture. He was fluent in Spanish. Um, there was a Fredonian revolt. Uh, there were the Turtle Bayou resolutions, a couple incidents of, of gringos trying to, to declare independence from Mexico uh, earlier than when it happened. And he not only disapproved of it, but he actually sent soldiers to squash those movements in collaboration with the Mexican army. All right. But the April 6th law changes everything. Now, he goes down and he has room to believe, reason to believe that he could speak reason in his mind uh, to the new liberal president who was much on a very far different 
position in the political spectrum than his predecessor Bustamante was. His name was Gomez Farias. And Gomez Farias, for instance, he was for um, uh, closing down the missions, uh, closing down the missions and uh, and allocating the land back to the Native Americans. It didn't work, by the way, uh, but he tried. OK, he took the public school system and secularized it and kicked the Catholic clergy out of it. And, and called for a modern secular school, public school system. All right. So this guy wasn't afraid of, of making ways from, you know, traditional things and, and, and much more liberal. And so, um, did someone have a question? Just let me know if you do, but at any rate, he came down and it, it's under speculation, exactly what was said word for word. But we know that generally that we know the broad picture, the outlines of it all, is that Gomez Farias and Stephen Austin, uh, they they kind of had a, not only uh, an ideological clash, but they also had a um, an ego clash as well. They both prided themselves as being highly educated cosmopolitan men. So there might have been a sense of competition once they even met each other. But to exacerbate that, um, Stephen Austin thought from, you know, just coming from the era of Jackson's presidency, that, you know, the whole idea of a popular mandate, that, hey, I'm not here to say if slavery is right or wrong. I'm just telling you it's an ugly reality that we have to face. And these gringos, you have to compromise with them on that slavery issue um, because that's popularly what they want, right? Because that was the byword of that day. It was like, oh, democracy, 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 even though we have a republic and not a, not a, a democracy. Um, Gomez Farias, as liberal as he was, he was very much more paternalistic uh, in his liberalism, almost like, like Napoleon, you know? Like, no, no, I want, I want liberal you know, ide ideological, you know, um, uh, goals and so forth met, but I have no problem with dictating those goals from Mexico City. I, I don't care what the mass majority of inhabitants of Eastern Texas would vote for, right? And not to mention he was, as a cosmopolitan man, Gomez Farias was found slavery to be repugnant and archaic. From a, from a bygone era. So supposedly Stephen Austin warns him. He contends that it was a mere warning saying, well, sir, if you do not compromise on this April 6th law and rescind at least some parts to it, and which included also, he said, you got to let some gringos in uh, because it was, it was very highly coveted land. And there was a lot of uh, press coverage in the U.S. encouraging people to go there. And he said, and plus you can't stop it. And so um, he says, I'm afraid if you don't, uh, you're going to have a rebellion on your hands uh, if you're not willing to compromise. And Gomez Farias contended that, um, that Stephen Austin uh, suggested and, or made comments that were uh, tantamount uh, to treasonous against the Mexican government. So we had him locked up and put in a jail. And remember, this is a proud man, Stephen Austin. He was humiliated uh, down in a dingy cell for like 15 months, like a little over a year. And months into that jail cell, he gets disgusted. And again, the, the idea of him being kind of caught in the middle in this popular narrative, um, the, there, were already, uh, there was already a segment of, of gringos in Eastern Texas who were calling themselves war hawks, that they were willing to go to war if need be uh, to make their demands known and to yeah. achieve those demands. If not, they were willing to secede and take that land for their own. Because remember, they tried with the Fredonian revolt, et cetera, already. And so some of them saw Stephen Austin as, a, uh, as an Uncle Tom, a kiss up to the Mexican government. And so a lot of them were working independently of him, uh, wanted no association with him, were willing to fight against him if need be. 
But now in his jail cell, he smuggles out a letter. And in that letter, he says basically to the, um, the cabildos, the city councils in Eastern Texas and their councilmen. He said, uh, you guys do whatever you deem necessary. He said, I wash my hands of this. The Mexican government is obstinate and corrupt. Okay, it's stubborn and corrupt. And so um, that kind of gives an added green light, right? Uh, to the Americans, the Norte Americanos, as they were known uh, in Eastern Texas. And then the spark that they needed, that they wanted, occurred with the ascension of Santa Ana. Santa Ana is such an interesting character. If you have time to read about him, right, what an interesting character. This guy, at one point, he helped uh, against Spain as a liberal, against Iturbide, who called himself an emperor in Mexico as a liberal. But then Gomez Farias, right, is kind of an uber liberal. And there was a famous, I kid you not, right at the time when he declared the um, the decision to uh, shut down the missions, uh, there was a major earthquake and um, it split the um, the sacred, it, it messed up the sacred relics in, in, in the front of the cathedral of Mexico City. And supposedly people popularly took that in their Catholic faith as a sign of God's anger toward this liberal administration going against his church, et cetera, et cetera. So Santa Ana then, then seems to go to the right on the political spectrum at this point, and he declares a holy revolution in defense of the Catholic Church, a standing army, and conservatism. Just a fascinating guy. So he has Gomez Frias overthrown because Santa Ana has control of the army. All right. But then he issues the seven laws, the siete leyes. After this, he's going to have even a more conservative constitution called the uh, bases organicas, the organic bases. But at any rate, look what it does here. It did away with state legislators. Remember, state legislators, even in Mexico, and even, uh, well, I don't know if I'd go so far as say Spain, but Mexico for sure, uh, they were elected at this point. So he did away with those. He made state governors, instead of elected, handpicked by himself. He dissolved some checks and balances between the three branches. He placed the state militias under his direct federal army. And he made property requirements to be a citizen so high that it disenfranchised or took citizenship rights away from 80% of the Mexican people. So this is where you get that old court history that we received as kids. I did. That the guys at the Alamo were heroes and martyrs, right? Mm -hmm. Because Santa Ana was a tyrant, as they called him. Uh, some in the Alamo were Hispanic. Uh, you had um, the Seguin, uh, S-E-G-U-I-N, with a, the accent on the I. Uh, Erasmo and Juan Seguin, father and son. Uh, who fought against Santa Ana and for an independent Mexico or independent uh, Texas. Um, you also had flags inside there that said something about a return to the Constitution of 1824. And the 1824 Constitution was um, much more liberal. It was, in, in, in mainly, it was more federal. It, it reserved, it had a balance of central power with state and local powers. All right. So was there a political um, facet to this fight? Absolutely. Did a lot of them believe they were fighting against a tyrannical president? Absolutely. Okay. Nevertheless, inside the Alamo, William Baird Travis could have just kept it political and said, Liberty loving Americans, please come down to Texas 
and fight against a tyrant. Uh, we will employ a democratic government. We will allow economic opportunity for all. Well, for all white men, right? Instead of doing that, look what he says. Liberty-loving Anglos. Why not Americans? Why just Anglos? Come join the righteous fight, not just against a tyrant, but against a, quote, mongrel Spanish Indian and Negro race. So he's showing his true colors here. That, that, that ethnic prejudice was a part of this. There was this animosity, this uh, co sense of competition, and, you know, kind of like uh, two roosters in the same hen house uh, between the Anglos and the Latinos there in Texas. So at any rate, um, what had happened is Zacatecas, the governor, he refused to step down. He said that he was elected by his people. His people wanted him, and he, he did not concede to the handpicked new governor of Zacatecas. He also said the state militia belonged to him as the governor, not to Santa Ana. So Santa Ana raised an army and invaded Zacatecas, and they had, they had like a little mini civil war. Santa Ana crushed it, and he sent um, envoys up toward Texas uh, to warn and tell them that if the um, if the if Coahuila in Texas, if they kept up their stubbornness and their defiance of the April Six Law, uh, that he was going to invade them next. All right. Well, supposedly, when they met in Saltillo, Coahuila, that's where the lines were starting to draw. Not only politically right, with like libertarians versus those that were willing to concede to uh, Mexico City's centralized power over everybody, but also regional and ethnic. Regional and that almost all of the diplomats from Coahuila itself backed down, while those in Texas did not, okay? And then also, in addition to that, the... Um, a lot of the Latinos back down and, and a lot of those who were staying obstinate uh, in their stance were Anglos, okay? So the brother-in-law, his last name was Perfecto de Cos um, of Santa Ana. He was sent up and he, uh, he made it to a, a small city. I don't, was it Goliad? It might've been Goliad. I, I don't remember for sure, but at any rate, he, um, he sees that what some of the uh, Anglos are doing is they hear of Santa Ana coming and they began taking over the presidios, uh, the local military forts uh, from the Mexican uh, army because they were very sparsely manned, right? With very few soldiers. They're taking the cannon, the ordnance, the ammunition and so forth, and the guns, the muskets. Then in addition to that, um, he gets to this particular town and shame on me for not remembering exactly which one it was, but he tells them, he warns them and says, um, stand down, uh, evacuate the Presidio and we will, uh, we'll come to terms or else the army's coming. And they fired a shot at him. And so at that point he came back down to Santa Ana, told him what had happened. And Santa Ana was a very proud man. And Santa Ana uh, declared uh, Deguayo. And with Deguayo, it was an old Spanish thing whereby you, uh, you didn't take political prisoners, that you're demanding uh, that there's a region that is involved in a treasonous rebellion, and you're, you're going to fight them to the death, including taking prisoners of war and executing them after. So at any rate, he heads up there, and... Um, some of the guys under Sam Houston uh, is Sam Houston was so interesting is he assimilated partly with Cherokee and Native American tribes and was very progressive for his time period on his stance regarding them. But yet that did not extend to the Hispanic people. But at any rate, um, and he also, of course, claimed political reasons. And so, um, but he, he said that we we haven't gained enough numbers 
uh, with an armed force uh, to take Santa Ana on yet. We have to continue to, 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 to stay on the move, engage in guerrilla warfare. Remember like guerra is war in Spanish, guerrilla is little warfare. Uh, attack them in small spots and then run and hide, etc. He said, until we get greater numbers. Well, some of the groups said, no, we're not leaving here in San Antonio. Uh, we're taking a stand uh, here at the Alamo. And it had been a mission. It had been a cotton factory. And now it, it become a legendary place where the Americans are going to die. So there are about 200 of them there. And Santana came up in late February of 1836 and um, attacked for about a week. And then they breached one of the sides, uh, a break in the walls, uh, where they just had had thatched, um, uh, felled uh, tree branches and stubs, et cetera, to try to patch up that hole. And it didn't work. They broke through that on, I think, March 6th, 1836. And they came in and, and, and killed the inhabitants uh, in the Alamo. Um, so you had Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett was like a young Andrew Jackson in a way. Um, he, that whole log cabin campaign uh, phenomenon we talked about, right? Where you just um, try to prove how common of a man you were, of what poor origins you came from, from the back country and all that. That all played perfectly into his biography. And he had been, he, he lost re-election as a senator or a house rep uh, in Tennessee and decided to move down there. So he had been a politician in Congress and he was well known and loved. So of course people are gonna see him as, as a, um, as a, uh, uh, excuse me just for a moment. I apologize. Okay, never mind. Um, they're gonna see him as a, um, a martyr. Uh, James Bowie, uh, uh, the famous Bowie knife, um, uh, that guy, uh, he had been a part of a murderous duel. Uh, he had a vicious side. Uh, he got sick and was killed in his in his in his bed. Um, William Barrett Travis was in trouble with the law as well, and so Chicano historians make that clear that these were not just wonderful heroes. Okay, um, and I'm I'm kind of in line with Chicano in, interpretation here. Is that I'm saying that you know this. This whole generation of Americans, uh, going back to the front uh, of the section, uh, mm -hmm. combined racism with a lust for other people's lands, right? And the politicians were all too happy to give it to them because it, it won them votes and it kept them in power, okay? So when Polk did what he did to provoke a war, um, you know, you could make the argument that um, he was doing what the people wanted. Uh, he made it very clear. Uh, he's the only president I can recall that actually ran for the presidency claiming he only wanted one term. He just wanted California. He wanted one term and he was done. And he, he, he kept to that word. So look what he does here. He, um, uh, the guy before him was John Tyler. He also was from that demographic of the 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 West, um, humble origins, uh, identification with the Democratic Party, even though he technically was a Whig. Uh, the Whig Party kicked him out. He was so consistent with Democratic policies. The only president I know of to be kicked out of his own party. And because um, remember, he wasn't even elected. Uh, um, William Henry Harrison uh, died in office. Remember, he was only president for like a month. He had pneumonia. So Tyler had finished his term. And so he was a lame duck president. He lost re-election. Um, he um, knew he was out in March. And he said, you know what? I'm going to ask Congress to annex Texas. He had nothing to lose. And um, I'd like to study him more personally. I've never read a book on him. Uh, the president. But at any rate, he did that knowing that Mexican politicians had made it clear, both liberal and conservative. Uh, America, if you tr even try to annex Texas, that will that will provoke us to war. That's how badly they wanted to re reacquire Texas. 
All right. Because remember, after the Alamo, uh, Santa Ana and his men were, were captured at San Jacinto. Uh, J-A-C-I-N-T-O is the name of the river. Uh, Houston and his guys, they they followed uh, Sun, is it, uh, Sun, Zi, Sun Tzu, the, the, the art of war writer in China, where he stated that you not only hit your enemy where he's weak, but sometimes you hit him ironically where he knows he's strong because he puts his guard down. And that's what happened. Santa Ana had three. He split his army into three. He had done so. And then the three segments met, and they had incredible numbers. And um, in uh, before the dawn, while they were sleeping in their tents, they were attacked at the San Jacinto River, and Santa Ana was captured. And Sam Houston forced him under a famous tree to sign over Texas as a republic, an independent republic, or his life. And he did. So Texas is unique in that it was its own country, its own, quote, Lone Star Republic from 1836 to 1845. But now Tyler says, we want it. And then Polk came in and he finished the job asking Congress to do so. Then, if that's not bad enough, as far as provoking a war with Mexico, he sent ambassadors continually to Mexican Mexico City uh, trying to buy California. And he knew they were insulted even by the offer. So then when that didn't work, he picked a fight over the border. Uh, there were a couple different, uh, I guess, treaties. One that said the border with the U.S. and Mexico in southern Texas was uh, the Nueces River. But the other one said it was the Rio Bravo del Norte that we know today as the Rio Grande. <clears throat> and so Mexico claimed it was the Nueces. We claimed it was the Rio Grande. Um, and so we sent our men across the Nueces. So according to Mexico, that's their territory. And we sent them all the way to the Rio Grande. And they they only had to stay about a week. And they got the skirmish that they wanted. A handful of Americans were killed. And um, they, uh, look at this uh, quote. I thought I had it here. I have it somewhere, darn it. But um, President Polk says, uh, the famous statement is American blood has been shed on American soil. All right. And a young new congressman uh, arose and questioned not only this war, but questioned the specifics of going into that area, fighting for, you know, picking a fight. Uh, were Americans really killed and exactly where were they? Skeptical about all of it. And that was a young Abraham Lincoln. So at any rate. Abraham Lincoln was a congressman during this time, wasn't he? I read that. He in was. Book. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And supposedly it was a key time, a pivotal time. Uh, the, I have the guy's name. I guess I don't recall it, but I have it in a future assignment of yours. Uh, he had a bunkmate and the bunkmate uh, supposedly is going to be influential in his life in uh, encouraging him to take a bolder stance against slavery uh, when he's a congressman. So yeah, um, so anyway, you guys get the point with number one. Yes. Number two, okay, I'll try to speed this up a little bit or we're gonna, I'm gonna keep you forever. First <laughs> thesis, okay, very simple. He contends that it's very romantic, as you see there in red, is that um, he contends that the Western, you know, everything about the West, uh, the, the the political circumstances, the geography or topography of the land, uh, just the conditions of it, the circumstances, and, and people moving over there, all of them inadvertently, right? It wasn't on purpose, but all of them inadvertently renewed meritocracy in this country. I remember meritocracy is when you get what you earn, what you deserve, regardless of your background, family connections, etc. That the West was there for the taking for virtually every demographic, men, women, young, old, whatever their ethnic background is, that it didn't matter. That the West renewed meritocracy. All right. And the two broad categories he puts it under 
is he states that there were indiscriminate, and that word is huge in his thesis, okay? That's why I have it in red down there. That there, because if 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 they were discriminate, that would go against his whole thesis, right? Uh, that there were indiscriminate dangers and opportunities in the West. Dangers and opportunities. So the danger part, right? Uh, you have a guy named Candy Moulton, or maybe been a woman. I don't know. I've I've read I read the book by Candy Moulton. Um, whoever that historian is. And he or she uh, has a lot of data. It's an old school book about um, violent deaths in the West. Uh, frostbite, buffalo stampedes, uh, drownings, hypothermia, heat stroke, cattle stampedes, snow cave-ins, rock slides, animal attacks. And there's there's a disease you get from drinking water. So what, what's it? Uh, are you are you referring to uh, dysentery? Yeah, yeah. I think it was dysentery. Drinking from the river. Yeah, and that that's that's a horrible way to go, from mm -hmm. what I read. So yeah, uh, the big ones were uh, dysentery, uh, typhoid fever, and cholera. Mm -hmm. Were the ones that were written down as the the main killers, uh, pathogen wise. So at any rate, right, the idea is, is those uh, circumstances in which these people died that I just mentioned, that, you know, the rivers, the weather, um, the water, the animals, uh, they don't discriminate, okay? And then in addition to that, is you literally have areas in the West under certain periods of time in which there was genuinely anarchy. Remember, anarchy just means no government. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Mind you, these were territories at the time, right? There weren't. Uh, they That's weren't right. uh, in. You know, they weren't. Yeah, they were just territories. That's only the right. army. Army was the only kind of law and order in the region, right? That's absolutely correct. So there That's were no police. Correct. So you see here, right? Um, well, before I get to that, um, there's a guy named Robert Stewart. And during the War of 1812, Robert Stewart traveled from Oregon back to Missouri, along backwards, along what would be known as the Oregon Trail. Okay. And by the way, we got those trails from the Native Americans. They were well aware of them. They made them, you know, and so we learned them. Our, our guy, our middlemen learned them from them. And so at any rate, Robert Stewart travels across it and he he pays to be interviewed. And um, I don't know if it was a book or just newspaper articles were written about it, but boy, it reads like a great, you know, action movie on the West. Uh, so thirsty that they drank their own urine at some points. Um, uh, held at gunpoint by the Crow and the Shoshone Native American tribes. And they they uh, they um, uh, extorted them. They said, "Give us some of your food. Give us some of your weapons, or else we'll kill you right here on the spot." Um, bear attacks. I mean, you name it. Um, the um, the Snake River, the Columbia River. A lot of people drown. The Platte River, over further to the east in Nebraska. A lot of people drown. Is this is this time period before or after Sacramento existed? The, that's a good question. When did Sacramento, when was Sacramento established? And I can't tell you exactly. I'm so sorry. Um, but I, but by this time, I'm almost positive Sacramento, because uh, I obviously the name, right? The, the, the Holy Sacrament, um, it, it, it was, uh, it was claimed by the Spanish and in and, and the Mexican and inhabited and ruled by the Mexican government after 1824. So yeah, by this time it certainly had been established, but I don't remember if it was the Spanish or the Mexican government that established it in exactly so the, what decade. But the pioneers, when they got to California, did they get to a city or did they get to just nothing? That no, that's a great question. Is most of them found the gap? Um, there was a gap. I it was like at least two and a half miles wide uh, in the Sierra Nevada foothills. Because otherwise, right, you had to traverse across or over the Sierra Nevada mountains 
Uh, I see them when I'm on a plane. You can see the Sierra. When you're coming from Texas to California, you can see them if you open the window. Nice. Yeah. The yeah. Sierra Nevada, yeah. I've yet to do that. I've just driven through them. But um, <laughs> but at any rate, the 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 Mexican government knew that's where the gringos are gonna come, very likely, right? Yes. They had a guy named uh, Johan von Suter, uh, a Swiss guy uh, who had a lucrative business uh, in the past uh, in the, uh, the Cooley system, uh, C-O-O-L-I-E. The Cooley system was using Asian laborers, some whom had been Shanghai, had been abducted forcefully and taken uh, you know, without their permission uh, to work in the fields uh, as like indentured servants, as virtual slaves. Um, so at any rate, he was successful enough, uh, to, um, impress Juan Alvarez, who was the governor at the time of Mexican California. So Juan Alvarez says, I'm going to send you into the Sacramento Valley and I am going to, um, have you be my policeman, uh, regarding the, the, uh, you know, the, um, Norte Americanos or the gringos that come into our territory, into our state. So they began coming in, right? And one of the first parties to make it in there, uh, by the way, 1843 was a big year. Uh, the Methodists and Baptists uh, made it across, uh, went up into Oregon and uh, established missions to try to convert the Native American tribes. Mm. Uh, it went back to a, a thing that was uh, brought forth, because remember, you're going to get to it soon, their anti bellum reform movements. They're trying to like, change and improve the world in all kinds of respects that we'll get to soon. But that included a lot of religious fervor. And uh, there was a story of a couple Nez Perce uh, chiefs who made it to St. Louis, Missouri, and said that they their people were craving the white, the pale faces uh, black book, the Bible. So we don't know how true that is, but it ran rampant throughout the churches in the East. And they said, we need to save the Indian souls. So 1843, uh, for whatever reasons, I've never read a biography just on them, uh, but Marcus and Narcisa Whitman, W-H-I-T-M-A-N, uh, they made it there. Uh, the wife's diary was turned into a book, and they were, uh, they were martyred. They were, they were murdered uh, by the Native Americans there. And it actually, ironically made more missionaries want to come. Uh, and so uh, beginning there about 1843, that's when the United States said, well, you know what, maybe we ought to establish at least some, um, some practical logistical help. So that's, uh, it, it wasn't soon after that, or it was soon after that, that they established like the Pony Express, right? Where they would send mail across and they would have um, the stations every 50 miles, okay, across what would be known as the Oregon Trail. And then they established military forts because they contended, and this is going to be a long-held uh, justification for getting involved in Native American drama, territory, war, is according to the Fifth Amendment and later 14th as well, uh, the American government is to protect Americans' lives, liberty, and property. And so does that mean when they leave the states as well? Well, that is to be interpreted by each administration. So some administrations, like at this time in the 1840s, uh, said that it did until that. So they established these forts and they had maps, cartographers were doing their thing. They had a, a topographical expedition, remember from Lewis and Clark, another guy named Zebulon Pike and others who followed. And they were trying to really map down, give instructional help, uh, provide um, food and, and, and basic necessities and weapons uh, to the, the people, the pioneers that were crossing, et cetera. And then, of course, the beginning points in Missouri were like a, a, a madhouse, uh, all kinds of peddlers and, you know, um, business owners were trying to sell everything to the people at the beginning of the trip, right, to help them on their way over there. 
But to demonstrate how dangerous it was, right, is some people look at the fact that how often it happened, that of their own accord, um, the settlers would combine in posses uh, with several wagons, and they would uh, write down like literal, like constitutions of what they would abide by. No one would go crazy and steal from anybody. They would equally protect one another against Native American attacks. That's where you get the term circling the wagons, et cetera, right? And so, uh, and they, they, um, they had, they were binding in a court of law, uh, these informal uh, personal constitutions they were writing and signing. So at any rate, you know, some people say, well, why would they do that? Well, the, they, they would say they did it out of necessity uh, because it was so dangerous. It was so tough to make it across. Then you also have the fact that um, the, uh, the mountain men, that was a generic term for them. You see some of the first Western Europe, people of Western European extract, like Anglo-Americans, et cetera, uh, British, French, Russians, um, were in the far West because of the, uh, the fur trading business. Uh, the 1820s, that was the decade for the fur trade. Okay, with uh, otter, sea otter and beaver pelts, etc. Uh, I read a book that contended that the price of a um, of a hide here in California went up eight hundred percent in Canton, China. If you can make it to the coast of China, eight hundred percent profit. So it, it, they became in vogue. Uh, hats, jackets, etc., made of these furs. So at any rate, um. They started off being granted monopolistic privileges. Uh, you had the um, the Hudson Bay Company. You had the um, uh, Muscovy Company of Russia. These other major companies, right? And it got much more messy uh, at the time of Manuel Lisa, like in the 1830s or so. A Spaniard named Manuel Lisa uh, began... Uh, paying for ads in the major cities in the East Coast, asking for Americans to come and work for him uh, and make a lot of money. And so a lot of Americans at that time began wanting to cross for, for uh, financial reasons, okay? And so the, the whole system, the fur trading system kind of became um, democratized, became more capitalistic rather than like a mercantile system where only monopolies are allowed to do it, okay? But that's how the British and we got involved in Oregon, in the state of Oregon, which at that time included uh, Washington and um, what is it, Idaho next to them. So at any rate, um, all this is happening. And the, uh, the uh, mountain men, like Robert Stewart, they began selling their stories as well as uh, their services as scouts to accompany you across the West. Because remember, these men, these uh, mountain men, they were the uh, successors to the French runners of the forest. I, I don't begin to know how to pronounce it, but it's like Coriard des Bois. Uh, these runners of the forest were these French, um, you know, kind of uh, pre-capitalists, businessmen who married Native American women, had biracial kids with them, learned the Native, Native American languages, formed alliances with Natives, learned their secrets, learned the best passages and ways, survival techniques, all of it, you name it. So they became celebrities by the 1840s. So you had uh, Kit Carson, you had Jedediah Smith, you had Tom Fitzpatrick, uh, just to name a few. And so um, that also helped to publicize the West and get a, more and more thousands and thousands of more uh, Americans over there. And then, as you know, the 49ers of 1849, uh, over 80,000 uh, registered on the Oregon Trail alone uh, to California uh, in 1849. So at any rate, amongst those coming before the 49ers was a group under two guys named Bidwell and Bartleson, okay? And um, I'm going to write these kind of as notes, okay? 
the Bidwell slash Bartleson group. And in uh, Oregon, it was the Spalding group. Just the names of the, the, the last names of their leaders, okay? According to some historians, they were like tro Trojan horses coming in. And I'll explain that. Is um, Let's see here. Johan von Suter, right? Going back to Sutter and that gap in the Sierra Nevada. The Bidwell Bartleson group comes in. He has them detained. He asks them questions. He inquires of this and that, looks them over, and sends a letter to the comandante of all the armed forces of Mexican California, who was Vallejo, uh, that Vallejo is named after. So Vallejo, he comes down to, to look at them himself. And Vallejo had had a very cosmopolitan upbringing. Um, he had Scottish and Belgian and these other um, nationality uh, tutors and teachers to give him a fine education. They taught him to be cosmopolitan and liberal, etc. And so, you know, he, he prides himself on being a man of the world, not just of Mexico. And so he's open to people from, of other nationalities, etc., as long as they're good people. And he, he decides that the Bidwell Bartleson group are good people. Uh, the two kind of adjectives that I usually use and my way of summing up what I've read anyway, are um, enterprising. I remember enterprising is that you're hardworking and you're very progressive in what you bring to the table economically to your area. And also basically benign or harmless. They were school teachers, Sunday school teachers, farmers, et cetera, okay? So he said, you know, what could be the harm in that? So let them in. Well, after that, they became, they, they supposedly were a lot less stringent in how many people and who they allowed to come in because of the Bidwell Bartleson group and their reputation. Same thing with the Spalding group up in Oregon. There was a governor, a British governor from the Hudson Bay Company named uh, McLaughlin. And McLaughlin basically said the same things about the Spalding group and allowed them to settle in the Willamette, like the name William, uh, but it's actually a different spelling. It's W-I-L-L-E-M-M-E-T-E. -E -E. I, I may have messed that up. There might be one M and two Ts. Anyway, it's known as the Willamette Valley, and that's where the Americans were allowed in British Oregon. And we're going to use our numbers flooding into Mexican California, flooding into Oregon to politically flex our muscles, our president's will, uh, to try to impose our will on those regions. As a matter of fact, you have some scary quotes from people like Andrew Jackson, as early as him in the 1830s, saying that that's the key to um, colonization. That's the key to imperialism, is you get the numbers in there first, and then uh, your flag will soon fly over that area. But at any rate, during the gold rush, President Polk disregarded the Northwest Ordinance. The Northwest Ordinance is supposed to send, it was very methodical, send the land survey office in, they put everything into six square acre plots. So many make a town, so many make a county, so many make a state. Uh, they sell the land. Sometimes the government puts a price ceiling on how much they could charge per acre. Sometimes they have it by um, auction. It varied, that part varied. But it was very methodical in, in, in establishing, you know, um, institutions like city governments, sheriff departments, et cetera. Well, Polk disregarded that when they found the famous gold chunks at Sutter's Mill on January 24th, 1848. They were, they were uh, cutting vertically um, the, the main rivers, right, with the, um, the feather in the Sacramento. I think it was the Sacramento River. They were uh, uh, 
what they they were cutting that the width of the river in half to increase um, the pressure of the current so that it would power their sawmills. And when they did, they found literally in the rocks of the area that they had just dried up uh, uh, superficial flecks of gold. Uh, uh, they, they call it placer uh, gold, okay? That you could just literally grab from the riverbed. So they sent a famous huge chunk to the president and he deliberately opens up a rat race. He says, heck with the Northwest ordinance. We haven't even zoned it out yet. We haven't established any governments, local governments yet, but the gold is free for the taking, whoever can get it. So Polk deliberately created a rat race with the gold rush. So hence when people came in, right? It was kind of uh, each man for himself. Uh, if you were outnumbered and it looked like you had a good spot to find gold, they literally would pull guns on you and threaten your life if you didn't leave. And, um, you know, you put in a shovel with a hat on it, like in the movies, they tried to do that. And sometimes it, in some areas, perhaps it worked, but in many areas, it didn't mean a thing, right? To the next intruder. And so um, at any rate, you have that phenomenon. And so uh, you do have evidence of things being rather um, chaotic in the West. And that also supports his thesis that there were indiscriminate dangers in the West, the whole Wild West image, right? All right. There's more I could say, but I'm going to, I am i don't want to go forever. All right. A um, couple good books with this. The, the most famous old school one is The World Rushed In by J.S. Holiday on the Gold Rush. Very fascinating. Another guy I like who really you could tell loves uh, the um, the Gold Rush era and has written quite a bit on it is um, H.W. Brands uh, of uh, University of Texas, a professor there. So at any rate, um, it, it, it's fascinating. I, I wish I had more time. Uh, we could easily do at least one class just on the Gold Rush. But you, um, you not only had that, but then you had this right here. Um, oh, and by the way, if you look up um, Mexican newspaper accounts of the gold rush, all right, you should be able to find some fascinating quotes, okay? They had, uh, like, for instance, the Alta California was a, a big newspaper in California uh, in, Sp in the Spanish language. And um, it contends that people were making, I can't remember how much, but it was ridiculous. Like even back then, for their numbers back then, they were making over $100 a day uh, in the diggings. They said without any skill, without any instruments or expensive tools, and without hardly, yeah, like I said, skill or any knowledge. Uh, it was just that easy pickings in 1848 if you got here soon enough. So you had some Bonanza Kings who made it rich, who got here first, all right? Then in addition to that, you could receive up to, according to J.S. Holiday, $1,000 in loans. The bankers flooded into San Francisco and Sacramento uh, to offer loans with interest, of course, uh, to pay back uh, to the, uh, the settlers. Then in addition to that, when they did establish local courts, they began granting squatters' rights to the to the uh, people that came in. If there was no one who could prove he owned that land, but get this, in some cases, even if there was a known proprietor, but yet he had not cultivated the land, had not improved it, they could force him to sell that land to the squatter. But if no one, uh, and then, uh, and in some cases, they even would confiscate it and give it to the squatter for improving it. It was crazy. So you had opportunities as well. And then, like I put up here at the top, mining the miners, just looking for a service or product that the miners would like. Okay. And um, so they come in, they, they find gold and in, uh, in dust and nuggets. They traded in with people in Frisco, et cetera, with the, um, 
with lucrative returns. And people are there right away to try to take those dollar bills out of their hands. They provided entertainment. They provided food and drink. Everything you could think of, right? They'd established in some of these towns. And the same thing happens with the railroads, where, wherever the railroads went through. The same thing happened with the cattle towns, where the cattle were brought in large numbers to be shipped off on the railroads. They, anywhere where people would make money in mass, you know, in one in one dealing, uh, people wanted to strip that money from them right away by offering them a good or service. And so uh, you had that. And so, like I said, um, women uh, were known for having inns, uh, hotels, basically, a, a nice place to stay with bed and breakfast, etc. But at a cost, right? And of course, you have prostitution, and you had uh, gambling and uh, theaters, et cetera. Uh, the Chinese uh, did very well. Uh, I, I hate to mention this, but it's just the primary sources show it, you guys. That's why they have, it's a terrible stereotype, but it has historical um, data to support it, unfortunately, is that with the Chinese, is they were known for uh, their laundry services, um, as well as their, um, their restaurants, and thirdly, their opium dens. Uh, they made great money doing that, but especially the laundry services. Uh, they uh, just washing the clothes and the tools, et cetera. There was one case in the Sacramento area where there was a big riot uh, against uh, the Asians because they were doing too well. And, um, and they contended that they were accumulating gold dust from their pockets of their pants and keeping it for themselves and, and turning it over for money. <laughs> and so they attacked uh, this place where they were washing clothes in large numbers uh, in this area off the Sacramento River. And so, you know, you had opportunities. If you were there quick enough, if you wanted a new way to mine the miners, et cetera. Okay, so that's number two, that the West renewed meritocracy primarily because there were indiscriminate dangers, but also indiscriminate um, opportunities. So that it almost was kind of Darwinian, that if you were just the, the, the quickest witted, the smartest, uh, the cleverest, the, uh, the toughest, all, let's face it also, the luckiest, uh, that it didn't matter what your background was, you could make it in the West, okay? Mm -hmm. Then numbers three and four go against Turner's thesis, all right? Number three goes against Turner's thesis on the basis of racism. All right. Because remember, he says that the West renews equality of economic opportunity for everybody. Okay. And on number three, I beg to differ. I said, no, no, no. Look at the discrimination toward Hispanics and toward the Asians in particular. Uh, in the West, there's plenty of evidence for it, okay? Uh, for one, they were much more likely uh, with banditry and the sprees of murders, et cetera. They were more likely to, um, to be the, um, the victims of those and also a vigilante justice. Uh, 1855, you know, even a, a seven years after gold was found, uh, there were 48 uh, um, extra legal hangings in California. These vigilante groups had just formed because there was no, there was a vacuum. There were no sheriff departments, no police departments yet. So the uh, vigilante justice occurred. But sometimes that vigilante justice, you know, had an ugly face on it, whereby they especially wanted to go after uh, Mexican bandidos, right? Mexican bandits, et cetera. And there was also this notion that hey, we just beat you in the Mexican-American War. And so you need to uh, that you need to acknowledge that we've won this, this California land fair and square in a fight. And so this gold should be ours first, not, quote, your people. And so as far as this, uh, you know, distinguishing later on in the civil rights movement, you have Mexican-Americans say that they were the hybrid people. Mexican, but also American, not fully Mexican, not fully American, uh, caught in the middle of two worlds, right? 
And there's a lot of truth to that, I'm sure. But here, right, there was no difference in the minds of those in the press, politicians, uh, the popular, just popularly from the people of that generation is if you were dark skinned and spoke Spanish, it didn't matter if you were born in Guanajuato down in Mexico or if you were born in Sacramento, California. Uh, you were still the other, right? Um, the Chileans came and they knew how to use uh, mercury uh, to, dis to discern between um, uh, true and false uh, gold. And they had other tactics that they'd used from their experience in Chile. And it gave them an edge up. And there was a lot of resentment toward them for it. There was an incident in Sonora, California, where uh, an Anglo miner was found dead, his body. And of course, they blamed the Mexican people. They gave them a certain number of hours to get out of Sonora or they would kill them. They threatened to kill them. And so... Uh, uh, you also had uh, instances of race, of racist violence in Mariposa, I, I recall as well. And Richard Henry Dana, that was telling too. This guy goes to Mexican California and was treated like a king being part of our military. And he writes this seven years at the mast book. And he gives us that romantic image of the uh, Mexican people of California. Uh, very courteous and classy. Uh, the well-to-do ones anyway. Um, wealthy. Um, very warm, very passionate. But then look what he puts in his book. Imagine such land, he's talking about California, in the hands of a more enterprising people. So in that book, he's trying to encourage Americans uh, to come take Mexican California. So that all that, you know, that the seemingly positive image of the Mexican American he conveys in his book really is condescending. And he's calling to take Mexican California from them. All right. Um, you know what's interesting, teacher? What's that? And I'm not sure if this is right, but I think it was under Mexican rule that the California grizzly bear went extinct from them constantly hunting down these bears and putting them in bull rings and seeing the bulls um, gouge the bears to death. Wow. Yeah, there's a... Um, uh, I don't know what highway it is going up north towards uh, Mount Shasta. Oh, I forgot what highway it is, but there's actually a statue on somebody's ranch there. And it shows, uh, it's a big, it's a cast iron statue um, of a bull fighting a bear. And um, I, I researched a little bit of it and, I, and they, do, they used to do a lot of that back then. They would That's catch amazing. the bear. They were all over wow. here back then. The California grizzly was everywhere here back then. And wow. um, they, they they basically hunted it all to extinction. That was yeah, one of the things. Right? Oh, anyways, no, I, that's, no, I that that's a wonderful addition. Uh, yeah, in English they they call that bear baiting. Uh, mm -hmm. It was actually like an, a form of entertainment, even a, known as a sport. Yeah. Uh, but I was unaware of the Mexican people doing that. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I no no I no. I bet you're right. Okay, uh, that, yeah. that makes perfect sense for the time period. It really does. Mm -hmm. They would they they had fun doing it in their in their bull rings as a sport. You know that's what the the um what do they call the vaqueros used to do. Uh -huh. They would do bull fights and stuff like that, and uh, they would and that hunted them on that dwindled the population of the California grizzly bear until it went extinct long before our time. Yes, you know, and these bears existed all over northern Mexico as well. Uh, wow, yeah, that that's really cool. I I, I did not know that. Yeah. I was going to say, if you want to get a, if you want to get a good grasp of, of what we're talking about here, watch, uh, watch Gunsmoke. <laughs> but that's not. Sure. The case. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably. We got it. <laughs> okay, go on. I'm sorry. No, no problem. 
Um, no problem at all. No, I love that. I love when you guys, uh, I, I don't need to monopolize all the talking. Uh, trust me, I, I'm, I'm great with that. Mm. But you had anti-vagrancy laws, greaser laws, uh, foreign miners taxes that just overtly by law discriminated against Mexican-Americans. Okay. Um, forcing those Hispanic landowners unable to prove in court their ownership to leave their premises. It was known as the Greaser Law. Um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo stated that Mexican Americans were citizens of the U.S., right? Because they didn't cross the border, the border crossed them. And so they said, you're entitled to all the rights, privileges, and protections thereof, of citizenship, including to own your property. Well, unfortunately, they left the, the um, what's the word? There's a perfect word for that. Um, the execution of those laws to the states. That was a bad idea. So with California, right, they were much more rigorous uh, than other states. Like, for instance, they wanted longitude and latitude lines uh, on a piece of paper, on documentation, with a governor's signature and date, and with permanent boundaries shown, like they were very particular in, in, in proving your land ownership as a Mexican American landowner. So you had these grandees down in Southern California. Um, uh, one name that sticks out to me as a surname was Nieto, right? Like a grand, grandson. Uh, the Nieto family is down by like Disneyland. They own tons of land, right? But a lot of their markers were, were literally like boulders or rocks, and they had been moved somehow. So they had boundaries that had been moved. They also, a lot of them were pastoral. They had sheep or cattle roaming, so they weren't cultivating the land. And so there'd be, you know, large segments of land that to Anglo intruders, it looked like it was free, to the, free for the taking. So they would squat on it, start cultivating it, and then fight them in a court for that piece of their land. If they couldn't prove very well, very substantially in a court of law that they own that land, it wasn't acknowledged by the judge. And then remember the judges are elected. So now you have a majority of gringos, you know, you had 80,000 just come across the Oregon Trail alone in 1849. They, they now outnumber the Californios, the ethnic Mexican tech, uh, Californians. And so it was the popular thing to do was to give in to these squatters. You had intimidation and violence and extortion. A guy named Felipe Armesto Diaz is an incredible writer and historian from Notre Dame. And uh, he writes of all kinds of horrible stuff, uh, ways in which the, the Hispanic people were treated uh, at this time. Then in addition to that, right, is, of course, lynching. Lynching, in some of the cases that I've read, oftentimes had to do uh, so many times uh, with about three things. One was some type of alleged crime, just generally, right? Uh, theft, murder, most of the time. Secondly, were um, sexual taboos. Uh, Mexican-American men with Anglo women, they, they did not abide by it. Of course, they were fine with the other way around, with Anglo men with, with Mexican-American women but not the other way around. There was that double standard as they did with African-Americans. And so I, I've read of, of, of young Mexican-American boys uh, lynched uh, for, um, for being with a, a blonde-haired blo blonde uh, American girl. And, um, and then also, of course, economics. Uh, you had a guy named um, Cortina. Uh, that wasn't in California. I think he was in New Mexico. Uh, but they were fighting over like water and pivotal lands and salt and other resources. And they were just going back and forth in these like, you know, economically driven wars. So anyway, you have all that. And then, um, let's see here. Yeah, the foreign miners tax. Then I have the term proletarianization. If you don't mind, I'm gonna get back to that after I, I mentioned the thesis on number four, the final one. This one is a critique of Turner's thesis, 
but instead of it being based upon ethnic discrimination, and that's why there was not true equality of economic opportunity in the West, right? This one says that it is the same old phenomenon that's always existed is it takes money to make money and those already with money and connections are always going to win out over the less um the less armed you know those with 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 uh fewer funds and fewer connections so that mainly we're talking about corporations and big businesses won the west ultimately like they do everywhere else all right so for one is um, in mining, uh, according to Alan Brinkley, a common textbook for US history, he contends that the vast majority of wealth that has been extracted through minerals, uh, through discovery and you know acquisition of minerals in the far West has been won by corporations, okay? He says it's not even close. And by the way, a lot of them were lesser known uh, minerals uh, like zinc and um, what else? Uh, there were a couple others that I'm like, wow, I wouldn't have thought of that. I, I noticed I, mining for minerals, sometimes when I'm on the freeway and I look over this, um, I don't know what you call them, estuaries, not estuaries. Um, it's a little man, it looks like a little man-made river type of thing, but it's concrete on either sides and they have a conveyor belt going up and down and there's there's minerals dumped on onto it and they and they go i see a lot of that kind of stuff you know when i'm wow. doing the job i don't know if that's minerals or anything but when i look at it i say what is that might be this might, might be mining minerals of some kind i don't know no that that makes sense to me i mean for what you just described that it absolutely sounds like that like it's, it's, it's mineral acquisition mm -hmm. yeah. and so what they did right is they had um a pneumatic uh, air powered or hydraulic water powered drills that were as big as a huge oil derrick. And they would blast into the sides of these mountains with them and extract most of the mineral wealth. Well, the common dude has no chance of doing that. He can't afford that machinery. He doesn't have the capital, the beginning money to do that. It happened in farming with the mechanical reaper, the mechanical thresher, the harvester combine. All those come about in the 1840s. The beginnings of them anyway but you had to have a lot of money uh, to do that and corporations start to spring up in the 1840s and with that right when they become public as you know anybody around the world could buy can buy shares in their stock and that gives them a lot of money to play with okay and then also um in uh, in addition to farming and mining is uh cattle ranching uh you had a bonanza uh, Rutherford B. Hayes and other leaders of America have at times, kind of like what Polk did with the gold rush, have declared kind of open season on the Western cattle. Because remember, there were millions of roaming cattle uh, from the time at least of Coronado of 1540, okay, roaming the West. And of course, they said with the one criterion is they're not to be branded. They're, they're, they, they have to be, you know, unmarked, unclaimed cattle wild cattle, that they're free for the taking. Well, this is going later beyond the scope of our class, but like, in, I, I looked something up and it was like 1872 alone, you could get $70 for a bull. That was back then. Mm -hmm. So they had their times where the market was incredibly lucrative for the cattle industry. So what you did initially, right, is you had the early stage of the vaquero, the, the, the cowboy, right? So you go down, uh, into southern Texas in particular, you uh, you go for the cattle. Now remember, the when you would go through a ravine or some vulnerable geographical spot, a lot of times someone, according to the primary sources, would try to get the drop on you and point guns at you and demand your cattle from you. So there were a lot of dangers inherent in it, for sure. And I read this again from like Candy Moulton's books. But at any rate, um, they... Um, if they can make it to the nearest uh, market, and of course, later on, that's going to be train depots in Kansas. Uh, they make it to that cattle town. They make a killing in money. But eventually what happens uh, just after the Civil War 
is the the railroad tracks make it all the way down into cattle country. There's no more need for a long cattle run because you could put them on a train right where they are, right? And the wealthiest guys end up buying most of the land. And in 1870s, barbed wire is invented and they set off all their stuff with barbed wire and they keep anybody from grazing their animals on it. And they have lucrative contracts made already to sell that cattle eastwardly most of the time. And that's where Chicago really took off as a butchering city. So at any rate, um, so the Vaquero ends up becoming kind of obsolete and he has to just work on a rich ranchero's estate and get paid for his daily work. Uh, and it was not well-paying according to the textbook Created Equal. Um, it, it, there was not room for mobility of moving up into a white collar position. All right. But then also you're going to get the beginning in the 1870s as well. We're moving a little, you know, toward the end period of our, our class period uh, under this course um, of the um, of agribusiness. And at first, agribusiness was highly centered on Asian laborers as an offshoot to the coolie system in um, the Pacific and Hawaiian islands, etc. But people like Johan von Suter or Sutter connected it to California. And so there were a lot of uh, Filipino, especially Chinese, Japanese laborers out in the fields. And right around supposedly about 1900, that started to shift toward more Hispanic workers. A lot of Hispanic workers were uh, worked on the Kansas Topeka Railroad. And a, a, um, a lot of Hispanic workers worked for the Anaconda copper mines. All right. But I'm saying this for a reason is that some of these corporations, they chose them parasitically. They said we won't have to we won't have to pay them as well as we'll have to pay a white American to do the same job. And it was ironic, right? Because they developed reputations, the Asians and Hispanics, for being um, diligent, working hard, for being efficient, doing the same job that a white American can do, but twice as quickly, and also for being docile. Uh, doing what they're told and not being rebellious. So ironically, those positive stereotypes helped encourage exploitation of them as laborers. So certain companies, certain corporations, they wanted them as their workers to exploit them. So of course, the Central Pacific, right? Hired, oh my goodness, like it was ridiculous. It was at least, at one point it was over 14,000 uh, Chinese laborers, uh, coolie laborers to come in. And about 12 to 1400 of them died on the job. Over a thousand died on the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. One of the things is they were known to have a diminutive, small physical size in their reputation. So they would put them in these baskets and hang them off the sides of the Sierra Nevada mountains have them chip away holes and put dynamite in them and hope that they pulled them up in time after they lit the stick of dynamite. They had them do all the dangerous jobs. So at any rate, there wasn't, they didn't need to have laws, right? Kind of like the term they use for women, a glass ceiling, where they say, you know, there weren't actual laws that said women can't get this job. Women can't be promoted. Uh, women will be paid less, but they just did it anyway, right? That type of glass ceiling existed for the Hispanic and Asian immigrants and Hispanic and Asian Americans here in the far West. They just weren't paid the same. Um, when the Chinese laborers went on strike in the desert, uh, they had already done the hard work through the Sierra Nevada. And by the time they got to the desert, um, they um, the plateau they uh, they they struck, and they um, the their Central Pacific uh, owners refused to. They they uh, they threatened to abandon them there, 
and not give them their their final due paycheck. And so they had to give in and go back to the same lower price. Uh, it was like three dollars less a week uh, than Anglo laborers, and they were known for doing a better job. And so the term that Chicano historians use is proletarianization. All right, like that guy uh, Jose Felipe Armesto. It's not Jose. It's anyway. His last name is Felipe Armesto. Uh, the proletariat is Marxist term for the industrial era. Industrial era. You can still be a farmer, uh, a farm worker, and be considered part of the proletariat. But just during the industrial era, a manual laborer in therein, in any capacity, that that has been called by Karl Marx the proletariat. So this term implies right that they were pigeonholed into the proletariat. Not only economically were they exploited and they weren't given as good of wages, they weren't given promotions, um, et cetera, but also socially and culturally, they were denigrated as they're, they, they're no better than that. That they were, they were born kind of like Aristotle when he said about... Uh, that the universe that nature created some men big brawny with small brains that they were meant to be manual laborers for those who are more clever and intelligent than they are you have that kind of that kind of uh you know horrible uh condescension where they said that well that's what mexicans do that's what asians do is they they work in the fields they work on the railroads etc would, would you call that a corrupt plutocracy or oh absolutely Absolutely. So yeah, number four, that's what I'm basically saying, Jacob, mm -hmm. is that the yeah. West became a plutocracy like everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. And then how did, uh, how did uh, Mexican Americans respond to that? Well, one way, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, they fought uh, beyond the system. Uh, you had banditry. You had uh, Joaquin Marietta, uh, uh, Gregorio Cortina, and they became almost like Robin Hood figures. Uh, Joaquin Marietta, he's the, the original source of the story of Zorro. And so, um, yeah, so fighting against the Anglo establishment and all that. Um, an interesting case of using both extra legal and legal means of fighting were the uh, Gorras Blancas, the White Hats. G-O-R-R-A-S, and then Blancas. Um, they were very interesting. Uh, they ran politicians for office, okay? Uh, there, there's a picture of a few of them. I used to know their names. These were pretty prominent guys in Texas, uh, but this picture right here. This is Joaquin Marietta, supposedly, and these are three members of the Gorras Blancas. But they, um, they would go at night, they would wear like um, flower bags over their heads and they would, um, they would cut the barbed wire of the rich um, cattle ranchers and try to steal their cattle. Um, you know, they would rationalize and say that they, 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 um, they shouldn't have, uh, have acquired that land anyway, that it belonged first to their people, that they used their unscrupulous um, connections with government to get that land and that wealth and those ca the cattle and all that. Uh, but they also, like I said, they ran people for political offices. And the state where it's known uh, that I've read for the Latino people to have the best success politically at, at, the, at the poll uh, was in New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico, uh, there was, uh, and you had exceptions. There was a guy named Esteban Ochoa, who was the mayor of uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And he did a lot for the Mexican American people, and he he ran in very confrontational terms, uh, and and successfully won. Uh, but going back to connections, if I could uh, mention this because I haven't, is another thing is not only actual capital that the corporations had over other people, but political capital, right? The uh, the um, the political connections, all right. So for instance, in, in defense of number four, I'm gonna write this, this term here, if you wanted to look up this incident. 
muscle sloth. I don't know if I'm saying that right. This place in Southern California. All right. Four squatters came upon land that wasn't cultivated, that wasn't claimed in court as owned by someone else. All right. So they got a local judge to concede that, hey, no one else was on it. They were on it for so many years and they've improved it. And so now it's there. Okay. Well, the Topeka, Kansas Railroad comes into town and begs to differ. Says, uh, scat, you guys, this is our land now. Uh, we're putting railroad tracks through here. And um, our permission from Congress trumps your mere local judge's decision to grant it to you. Congress trumps a local judge. Because remember, going back to the days of Alexander Hamilton, is the conservatives had always stated that if your economic endeavor were providing a good or service that is promotes the general welfare that supposedly brings benefits to all of America, that you ought to be encouraged, even subsidized, even helped financially in doing it. So there's no bigger example, arguably, than railroads. Howard Zinn, you know, you got to keep in mind, he's a Marxist historian. So he's always going to show how the rich are, are, are um, giving it to the poor. But that doesn't mean is he, he's without data to support it. He contends that millions of acres were given for free by Congress in the West to the railroad corporations as subsidies. So for instance, if you're going across dry land or flat land, plateau, um, you get so many miles of acreage or so many acres um, for each mile that you lay of track. You get the acreage adjacent and connected to it. Okay, so much of it. If it is desert ecosystem, then for the, the struggle you have with water, they grant you a little bit more in acreage for every mile that you lay and track. And then lastly, if it's mountainous, largely you're going to have to use nitroglycerin to blast through the mountainsides. It's going to be very expensive and time consuming. They're going to give you even more acreage for every mile that you go through. Well, there's evidence supposedly that it was very common for corporations to bribe uh, the land surveyors who came out on behalf of the government to tell to have them mark it down as mountainous. So it would maximize how much free land they got when it wasn't mountainous at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and another thing, one last example of them taking advantage of doing immoral stuff like that is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, um, what was it? The, um, you'll learn about it probably in your next class, the, the 17B. Uh, the, oh, it's a French name. But the Union Pacific on the eastern side, they received money to build a bridge that they never built. Instead of giving the money back that the government gave them to build that bridge, they formed their own phony company, Credit Mobilier. And they paid themselves for that bridge they never built and just pocketed the money. And then they bribed senators when they started looking into it uh, to shut them up. So this kind of stuff happened a lot. So when these guys come in, right, these people at Muscle Sloth, they're like, no, we're not leaving. And so they had a gunfight and they shot, they had a marshal and a deputy. They shot one of them. I don't remember if they killed him or not, but they shot him. They went all the way to Arizona to find a, a, a military fort, a, a regiment of soldiers, brought them to this place in Southern California to fight these inhabitants of muscle sloth and force them violently off their homes, off their property. So it's just one more case, right? With a politically connected, well-to-do win. So you see how number three and number four are revisionist. They go against the romantic thesis of Turner that the West remade 
equality of economic opportunity or meritocracy. Any comments, you guys? Any closing comments on all this? This is a lot. Well, why why didn't you mention George uh, Fremont? In oh a, man, in a book Fremont, read, right? In a book that I read, uh -huh. I mentioned him and how he clashed out here in California with a lot of the Spanish landowners. Absolutely, and, that guy, during, right? Yes. He his wife writes a biography of him, and 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 makes a hero of him. This dashing figure in this book, and the community, the merit, his generation seems to have bought it. He was part of the topographical expedition like Lewis and Clark and Zebulon Pike to go and look at the topography and, and, and also gauge the military strength and the, um, the friendliness of different tribes in the West. Mm -hmm. Well, the first time he comes into the Sierra Nevada, the Shoshone uh, attack him and he's low on provisions. So he goes into Mexican California into Sutter's Mill. Uh, Sutter arrests him. Vallejo comes down, right? They they question him, et cetera. And he gives him that story and says, I, I needed for refuge. We're being attacked. We're low on provisions, et cetera. He said, okay, fine. Well, he, it happens a second and a third time. And in those cases, right, he does not have written authorization from the United States to be in Mexican territory. And his stories are not adding up. Mm -hmm. So finally, they force him out. And he goes up to Oregon, and we know now that he met with a guy named um, Archibald Gillespie, and Archibald Gillespie was an American spy, and he likely told Fremont that war was coming, because we were picking a fight, basically, that mm -hmm. war was coming, and he needs to stay there in the far west for when it does to swoop down on California. Mm -hmm. So when he did, you had Ezekiel Merritt. Lucas Graham and these other troublemaking gringos in California, they'd already been involved in multiple uh, political fights and forays in Mexican California. Because he was thing, Mexico, it couldn't have been a worse time for them. Uh, during the Mexican American War, 1846 to 48, they had like three or four different presidents. Um, and then here in Mexican California, you had um, uh, Pio Pico. Uh, Juan Alvarez and a couple others. And at different times, one was claiming to be governor the same time another one was. One was in Northern California and the other was in Southern California. And so they would use people like Lucas uh, or Ezekiel Merritt and, and, and Isaac Graham uh, as their mercenary fighters. Wow. And so, but they also were known that they couldn't be trusted uh, because not only they just followed the dollar, but they they were uh, accused of extortion and other types of crimes that they were getting away with. Right. They came in when Vallejo was in Petaluma with his daughters eating breakfast, and they took him as a hostage. And, you know, they claimed that they wanted a bear, a bear flag republic like Texas had done. Mm -hmm. But if that were truly the case, why when Fremont came swoop down into Petaluma, why did they offer Vallejo over to him as a political prisoner? They clearly right. had designs to, to, for the U.S., not themselves and their own republic, but for the U.S. to take California. Right. right. So Fremont fought. They sent him down to Southern California, and he had his hands full. Uh, he and a guy named uh, Stephen Kearney um, uh, lost uh, – more than once in Los Angeles and then Southern California to Pio Pico's man and to the inhabitants of Los Angeles, uh, the, the, the ethnic Mexicans. But then uh, a guy comes in, and from what I read, he really plays the villain well, is a guy named Redfield Stockton. And Stockton came in by way of the Navy, and he declared martial law in Los Angeles. And he cracked down on the Mexican people. And uh, that's when things started going more the American's way uh, in the because the, there wasn't a lot of bloodshed in Northern California and Chicano historians. They still talk about that. They still write about that to this day. So right. there's a sense of malaise and apathy and fatalism amongst the Chicano people in Northern California. But boy, they fought in Southern California. Mm -hmm. right. So, yeah, oh, John yeah. C. Fremont. 
very pivotal in that story. I'm sorry I didn't even mention him. There's just so much. I mean, look at right. us. I only, know him. I only know of him because of a book I read. Like I said, I read that book and then it talks about him and how um, just briefly during the like around the time of the Civil War, which is probably a little after than this. Um, during the war, Lincoln wanted to replace his uh, commander in chief of the Union Army. I think it was McClellan. If, maybe I'm um, maybe I got it mixed up, but I, it's been about a, six months since I finished the book. So, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, so he they thought about putting Fremont from California over over to come fight, you know, against the South closer towards the East Coast. But they decided to leave him out there in California. Oh, um, darn! Yeah, you yeah. know what? I I apologize. I've kind of uh, I have have not read much at all on Fremont after the Mexican-American War. Oh, okay. Well, no, that's yeah, just something about that. No, but uh, the point that you mentioned when I think it was in uh, number three or number two, when you're, when you're talking about land surveying a lot, um, a lot of, a lot of the land, uh, the United, the U.S. government, and I'm no, I'm just a student, but the, I, I'm speaking about that book that I read on Lincoln, how the United States for the first time started to really take seriously lines, uh, line, land boundaries in counties and cities and things like that, particularly during Lincoln's presidency, because he was a land surveyor before he even got into politics. So um, I'm just sharing my knowledge of that book because I read this book and I just have oh, a lot sure. to say. <laughs> I talked to you about it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there, so. there is, there, there seems to be um, uh, a lack of that. Uh, to a degree that does limitedly support Turner's thesis of kind yeah. of a wild west. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there, there were definitely exceptions. There was a hanging mm-hmm. judge in Oklahoma that that gave a, I have his name down in my notes somewhere, but he gave a note and said, well, here's a list of suspects since they, we don't have the time and resources to bring them in. And they have been uh, written down as suspects from multiple uh, eyewitness accounts and in multiple areas they're likely guilty anyway. So just shoot them on the spot. <laughs> right. The deputy or marshal that was sent to the West to find them. Mm-hmm. So, right. You know, you do, you have some, there is some evidence for that wild West image. Right. Mm-hmm. And then just lastly, you guys, I'm going to say it real quickly. I promise because it's two hours now is the war real quickly. The guy in the Northern Mexico was Zachary Taylor. Okay. Um, his major Fights like were Rosalca de Palma, uh, Saltillo, um, and a big one was his biggest one was Buena Vista. Buena Vista, they had four trench marks to fall back into. They were in their fourth and final trench, receding to Santa Ana's army because he was outnumbered three to one. For one, Santa Ana left inexplicably. He claimed that he was low on ammunition and he was tired of seeing his men butchered. Uh, on the attack. And so he had no idea how close he was to winning at Buena Vista, and he just left. And then the reason why he was outnumbered three to one is the lion's share of troops were sent to his high, the highest commanding guy, and that was Winfield Scott. And he took the same tour. Some people think it was meant to be symbolic. He took, he took the same tour that Hernan Cortez had taken to capital to the Tenochtitlan capital, the same capital of Mexico City that the Aztec had. And when he went there, uh, there was um, uh, a place called Cerro Gordo, uh, C-E-R-R-O, and then Gordo, like fat in Spanish, G-O-R-D-O. Um, they supposedly got cannon up a steep hill that should have been impossible, according to the Mexican army. And they had young engineers that were incredibly adept at their job. And so it was an example of American technological superiority over the Mexican armed forces there. All right. And then in Mexico City, uh, the Battle of Chapultepec. Um, At Chapultepec, um, you had known the six heroes of this kind of West Point of Mexico. Who it, it got down to six military students from Mexico uh, fought hand-to-hand combat at the end. And the legend states the final one draped himself in the Mexican flag and jumped off the fortress to his death. 
uh, before he'd let the Americans grab the Mexican flag. That's so, what Sam Daniel should have done. <laughs> you know, if you want something, die for it, you know? He didn't. Yeah. Yeah, no, he didn't. Yeah, he didn't uh, really want he was, he was something else. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, he, um, he, a lot of people went against him after his wife died. And weeks after their long marriage and her death, he married a 15 year old girl. And I can't remember his age, but he, he was pretty old. And so the American people came, he had lost his leg in an attack uh, to the French for the French and the pastry war. Mm -hmm. And he, and he was uh, real kind of bombastic. He tried to be the hero in the eyes of the Mexican people a lot. And he, he buried his own leg with a lot of fanfare at that time. <laughs> Uh, people came and excavated his leg, <laughs> threw it out uh, from its burial place, and they they wanted his neck. So he was in and out. It, it's like a soap opera, the Santa yeah. Ana biography. You but at any rate, um, we won because we had superior uh, technology. The Mexican people did not unite with the darn politically and militarily. There was one famous case with uh, Zachary's men in northern Mexico, where they took one of the, the cities in uh, like, like Monterey, and they, they came in and they said, surrender your ammunition. And the Mexican uh, leading official said, if I had ammunition, you wouldn't be standing here. Because he had a guy named Valencia who hated him and had ammunition that he needed, and in the heat of battle refused to give him the ammunition. Because that of their personal like, enmity between each other. That sounds like something that would happen over there, yeah. And so just crazy stuff. And so at any rate, um, but Winfield Scott, he is somewhat reserved from the the um, the blame game a little bit uh, as far as the, uh, the American um, atrocities is there's a lot of evidence that he tried to uh, greatly mitigate all of that now he may not have done it out of humanitarian motives but he did it nonetheless uh he instituted strict justice with his soldiers uh if they had two uh witnesses to a rape uh they were to be um killed in front of the other american soldiers uh, wow. a mexican woman uh he made his soldiers go to mass in mexico city uh to catholic mass he um he had a uh, uh, reporting areas where Mexican citizens could come and report different depredations that might be done against them by the soldiers. He really mm -hmm. tried to minimize the the bloodshed in Mexico City when he was there. And then lastly, I promise, is one of the reasons why we did not try to take more than what we took with Mexico, uh, with California, New Mexico, Nevada, Colorado, Utah, right, uh, was that was racism sadly is a lot of southern reps said we don't want to take any of the mexican states because we don't want to incorporate their people under our flag and in in our republic so it was ironically so that that racism uh to a certain degree uh kept us from taking more of mexico than we already did mm -hmm. All right. And there's more, but I'm not going to do it. I promised you I was going to say one more thing, and that's it. And this is the last thing I'm going to say, teacher. This is a good book. You should read it. I read the Got whole it. thing. Yes. It's uh, a book on the author? the author is um it's uh, Carl Sandberg. Okay, Carl Sandberg. It's a very good read. I it took me a long time, but I, I it's it's a very good read. If you're interested in, in Lincoln and a lot of things during his lifetime, you should read it. Sure. Oh, I sure am. It's a beautiful book. Good. That's great, Jacob. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, guys. Um, I'm writing on the list of names here. Uh, two hours with an exclamation point. <laughs> so I, I promise I'm gonna I'm gonna reward you guys for this. Thank you so much. Okay. That is the reward. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> All right, no, teacher. I love Take it, care Jacob. Yourself. Thank you. Yeah. I enjoy having students like you. I, I love it because, yeah, Thank it you. just there's so much information. There's so much to learn. There's so much yes. interesting stuff. Exactly.
And I appreciate that. I really do. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. All right, mm -hmm. Clara, Raylene, Kevin. You guys have a good day and a good week, okay? Thank you. All right, teacher. See you next Thursday. All right, sounds good. Bye, Jacob. Bye. -bye. Bye.